thank you for everyone coming. We've got a very exciting presentation today. It is uh, fellow APC volunteer Kim Bison from New Sun Cinema, who will be talking about uh, the American Kestrel Falcons and the work uh, she does with New Sun Cinema and uh, the American Kestrel Falcons. Um, and Kim's going to present today. And then after that, we will have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Uh, so Kim, though, I will uh, turn it over to you for the, the rest of the presentation. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Owen. Hi, everyone. Um, as Owen said, I'll be uh, talking about the American Kestrel Falcon and uh, the conservation and education work that uh, my husband and I uh, involved uh, with. Um, lately, scientists have noticed that the American Kestrel population is in decline. Some of the causes uh, that they believe are um, loss of habitat, so conversion of grasslands and forest um, are limiting the a number of uh, perches, um, nesting opportunities for them, as, uh, as well the prey abundance in those areas. Um, other, another cause is uh, pesticides and pollutants. And the um, pesticides can reduce the clutch size uh, for the kestrels. As well, uh, they rely on uh, the rodents and the small animals that, uh, that they uh, feed on, and pesticides are destroying these animals. So um, another cause is uh, increased in, um, in predation. So they, um, they are susceptible uh, to uh, other birds of prey. So experts are going to continue to uh, monitor uh, and keep a close eye on this species. The uh, American Kestrel, if you look a bit about their uh, characteristics, uh, they're the smallest, most common North American falcon. Uh, they are about the size of a mourning dove. And uh, like many birds of prey, the female is a little bit heavier uh, than the male. So they have uh, strong uh, grasping feet, uh, sharp talons uh, that they use to uh, kill their prey. Their diet consists entirely of meat. And um, you'll see here in the, uh, in the images, we have uh, an adult female on top, uh, the adult male. They are slender, uh, pointed wings, long tails. They are um, outstanding flyers. Uh, the amazing acrobatic uh, abilities that they have, uh, turning, uh, maneuverability. Uh, it's quite amazing to, uh, to watch them. Um, they are one of the most colorful of the falcons and a little bit later in the presentation, you'll see some other images of them and you'll see those, uh, those brilliant colors. The, uh, another behavioral marker of a kestrel is that while perched, uh, you will notice that uh, they will do um, a lot of uh, bobbing of their tail, their heads. Uh, they prefer open habitat uh, for their hunting. They primarily hunt for uh, rodents. Uh, they are a, uh, what is referred to as a uh, cavity nester and um, kestrels feed during the daytime. So here we have a picture of uh, one of our nesting boxes. Back in uh, 2010, uh, we built nesting boxes, mounted them on steel poles. And in 2014, we made more significant changes uh, to the nesting boxes. As well, we um, began an HD live stream with one camera in the uh, nesting box. Then in 2020, uh, we made again some significant design changes and uh, established non-invasive nesting boxes. And I'll get into what that looks like a little bit later. But uh, now we have uh, two cameras installed. It, it gives us better opportunity for observing uh, the pair and their, uh, and their young. Um, the boxes that we have are one at 14 feet from the ground, another at 20 feet from the ground. So giving them options, uh, the rest of the dimensions of the boxes are the same. So the entrance hole is three, three uh, inches by four. 
So because uh, the lack of nesting uh, boxes or, or cavities uh, limits the kestrels reproduction and uh, population, this is where we felt we had the best opportunity to help. So here's a little bit more about uh, the nesting boxes that we currently have. You'll see here some images of uh, the cameras that we use. The top picture shows you the sliding drawer that we're able to access. It's a top camera and uh, we're able to pull that drawer out and clean uh, the camera. So the nestlings, uh, they squirt their poop uh, in that nesting box uh, on, the on the walls and, uh, and the ceiling. The um, side camera uh, that you see there in the bottom photo uh, is in a separate compartment on the exterior of the nest box. And it has a removable glass panel that we're able to pull out uh, and to clean. You see the bottom of the nest box, uh, we have uh, nesting material in there. This is uh, dust-free aspen shavings, and that um, is very important because uh, we wanna prevent any dust from blocking the uh, nestlings' nostrils. The um, construction of our boxes and the cameras, uh, we have a detailed uh, video on our website uh, if anybody is more interested in the construction. Um, and those two cameras, by the way, uh, have uh, infrared light source, and that illuminates the inside of the uh, box. The infrared is invisible uh, to the birds, uh, just as it is to humans. So who is New Sun Cinema? Uh, well, uh, our company is uh, not for profit. It's my husband and myself. Uh, we are passionate about wildlife and nature uh, and doing anything that we can to, uh, to help uh, species. So uh, we're happy to say that uh, in the past seven years, while we've had the opportunity to have nesting pairs uh, on our property, we've had, uh, in seven years, we've successfully had 25 American kestrel fledglings from our nesting boxes. And the um, high definition cameras is what's really uh, helped us to be able to uh, get a lot of that detailed information. So um, as I say, we're very passionate about wildlife. We are always learning and trying to improve and uh, one of our priorities is of course, to uh, better protect uh, these nestlings. So we have a website. We've got a lot of information on our website about uh, what we do specific to the American Kestrel. Uh, we have a section dedicated, it's called Kestrel Corner. And we have all sorts of data over the past seven, several years. Uh, about our experiences uh, with our nesting boxes and our pairs, as well as their young. And that data, we also provide uh, to the American Kestrel Partnership. It's a network of citizen scientists and professional scientists. And the professional scientists use this data to better understand environmental impacts, uh, such as pollution, uh, client, uh, climate change, habitat loss, that sort of thing. So another uh, interesting uh, item about the kestrels and where others can help is that uh, because kestrels feed mainly on insects, mice, voles, that sort of thing, they're a good friend uh, to farmers uh, because uh, if farmers in agricultural areas, especially with uh, cover crop, uh, these animals uh, could be damaging uh, the crops. And uh, by putting up um, perches and nesting boxes, uh, it becomes a win-win opportunity for both the species and the farmers. So arrival for the summer breeding season. Uh, the kestrels will arrive. Uh, and as you can see, this beautiful male uh, arrived when there was still snow in Winnipeg, which is quite typical. Uh, 
So a little bit about the uh, about the kestrels. Uh, they're they're referred to as a sit and wait predator. Uh, they hunt for insects, uh, small prey in open areas, short vegetation. You'll also see them along roadsides, especially in those agricultural areas. Uh, they primarily hunt from perches, uh, so along tree canopies, uh, over pastures, on utility lines, but. Uh, they will also hover and uh, hunt that way. So they will uh, flap their wings vigorously um, and they will look for uh, prey on, uh, on. So as they flap their wings vigorously, they actually are, look, they look like a helicopter in one position uh, as they search the ground for prey. And uh, kestrels also see ultraviolet light. And what this does is it helps them uh, to see the trails of urine uh, which reflect ultraviolet light uh, of those voles that are leaving those trails um, along the ground. So as I mentioned, uh, the kestrels will arrive uh, from their wintering range, usually in uh, mid to late March, and um, they will be competing uh, for a very limited supply of nesting cavities. Um, from other nesting uh, cavity uh, birds, such as uh, flickers. So the, um, the kestrels don't have the ability to actually excavate their own nests. They rely on old woodpecker holes, uh, natural tree holes, other human built structures such as ours. And uh, they don't use nesting materials. So you'll never see a kestrel with twigs in their, in their beaks. Um, if there are, uh, if, if there is loose material on the floor of the nest cavity, what they will do is they will hollow out a shallow depression. Uh, it's referred to as a nesting bowl. And uh, you see here, uh, top picture is a male and uh, he's hard at work um, finding nests, uh, the potential nests for the female uh, and building that uh, nesting bowl. Uh, that female is in the uh, bottom picture. So uh, the male searches out uh, the potential nests, typically along the wood edge uh, edges, middle of uh, open ground. He and she both uh, will defend very fiercely uh, the territory around their nest. And uh, so the male uh, will uh, show the female uh, potential uh, nests and uh, she will make that final decision. So here we have some pictures uh, inside uh, ne our nesting box. These are taken from the top camera. Um, American kestrels can reproduce as early as one year of age and the timing of the egg laying is very weather dependent. It's Normally around here, it's in uh, late April. The um, top camera, as you can see, is a really good view of, uh, of the eggs. Um, the eggs are typically laid uh, one egg every second day. And uh, what you're able to see by the top camera is the various formations uh, that the pairs will uh, place the eggs in. And the clutch size, um, it is very influenced by the food supply. So a female could lay one to seven eggs, uh, but uh, on average, it's usually about uh, four to five eggs uh, in, a, in a clutch. So during the, uh, what is referred to as the courtship period, uh, the male is bringing uh, food uh, to the female. Uh, this is demonstrating his ability to supply food. Uh, and uh, this um, also is the time, of course, when copulation is occurring uh, between the pair. And that happens any time from the arrival at the nest site until the first egg is laid. So here we have uh, now some a pair, they have their eggs. Uh, the female is on top sitting on some eggs. Uh, the male is uh, in the bottom photo. And um, the incubation is done uh, by both the male and the female. Um, the male actually will uh, come to the nesting box 
and call the female out uh, when he has food for her. And these particular photos are taken from our side camera and the great opportunity for observation for the side with the side camera is that it's enabling us to determine an approximate uh, date for the hatch. Because until the clutch is actually complete, um, there, the pair will not fully incubate. Uh, they will um, be brief as the leg aing period is taking place. But once the clutch is complete, it's a full-time job. And um, one of the other advantages of the side camera is that we're able to see the way that the uh, pair will um, sit and control the egg temperature of those eggs by the different positions of their body. Incubation is a long period of time. Uh, it's a long commitment for this uh, bird, uh, 26 to 32 days. It usually, it typically takes um, for incubation. So here's uh, again the pair, they are sharing uh, the incubation duties. A Little bit more about uh, the coloration. This picture really gives a, a good visual. Uh, we have the male on the left-hand side, the female on the right. So you see that the male uh, has the slate blue head and wings, uh, rusty back and tail. Uh, the male has a much whiter uh, chest and he will have spots on his chest sometimes a tinge of orange as well. The female is uh, more camouflaged. Uh, she's got the rusty red wings and tail. She, uh, her back is heavily barred uh, as well. Her breast actually has streaks of brown. So both sexes have uh, two um, black stripes on their cheeks. They have the blue crown uh, with a tinge of uh, rufous and uh, the American kestrels also have two spots on the back of their heads. And these act as false eyes, which may fool a potential predator uh, that approaches from behind. So now we have uh, the hatch has taken place. Uh, the eggs can hatch over a period of a few days and ideally the timing is close together. Uh, this is a bird prey and siblicide uh, is known uh, to occur. So the nestlings are born, uh, they're very small. Uh, they're born uh, blind and helpless. They're completely covered in a fine layer of white down. And that down is not sufficient for their thermal regulation. So they will rely on their parent to keep them warm. The female will uh, perform most of the brooding while the male is uh, providing uh, the female with food. So a few more shots of the same, um, the same group of nestlings. Uh, as you can see here, uh, that uh, the bottom left-hand corner, that female is, uh, ha has uh, a grasshopper. So the, um, the American kestrels will eat mostly uh, insects, grasshoppers, beetles, dragonflies, um, again, small, uh, small rodents, mice, vole. Um, kestrels will hide surplus kills in clumps of uh, uh, grass, in trees, fence, uh, fence posts, that sort of thing. They'll save that for uh, leaner times or they'll hide it from thieves. It's not uncommon to see a kestrel with food uh, and following close behind um, a crow, magpie, that sort of thing. So watching uh, any of our live stream, uh, do be prepared. Uh, there will be at times, potentially, uh, kestrels will have songbirds uh, as, uh, as the food for their young, uh, but songbirds, uh, and kestrels, they are wild species and they rely on that predator-prey relationship. <laughs> here, here we have uh, our little nestlings. Uh, they are approaching that, uh, they are one, one week old in this particular uh, picture. Um, they grow rapidly. Um, after a few days, their eyes are opened. 
um, around 20 days, uh, their body is about the size of, there is, is fully grown about the adult size. And um, what uh, will occur uh, when nature calls is that these nestlings will back up, they'll raise their tails and they squirt poop all over the walls and the ceiling. So you can see uh, that this nest box is getting uh, pretty messy. Um, it uh, is a smelly place, definitely. Um, you'll see here that uh, these nestlings uh, also have uh, some leftover food uh, and cough ups, which are referred to as pellets um, on the floor uh, of their nesting box. So at this stage, you see, uh, they're still down covered uh, with a few sheets uh, maybe present. At that two week stage, um, you can see here, uh, they are um, really starting to, uh, to develop. Uh, they're getting quite large. Uh, the sheets are distinct. Uh, the primary feathers are beginning to develop. And they're just so funny to look at. Now at this three, at this three week stage, um, what we see here is the back feathers are uh, filling in almost completely. And um, if you look at that um, top right hand picture, uh, this is actually a little male. Uh, you can see that uh, his wings have that slate blue color to them. Uh, the tail feathers are also starting to lengthen and um, the terminal banding starts to appear. And in that particular picture, uh, you may be able to see that there's a white band. That's an indicator as well of a male. And at three and a half weeks, again, rapid, rapid development. Um, we see here that uh, the male's uh, breast has spots, the female uh, in that bottom left-hand corner, uh, the female has that uh, barring and striping of the chest and the breast is almost fully feathered uh, with very little down remaining. So as the um, fledge approaches and fledge refers to uh, when the nestlings leave the nest, um, they start to do a lot of wing flapping in that nest box. And here we have a beautiful image of uh, this young female with her wing stretched out. So the pre-fledge uh, period, the body size um, really starts to resemble uh, miniature adults. Uh, in the top left-hand corner, we have the female in amongst uh, the nestlings. We start to see uh, the tail feathers uh, lengthening. And uh, in the top right-hand picture, we see uh, one of the nestlings uh, peering out of the hole. And uh, I can see that uh, there are five bands, which is telling, this is giving us an indication that this is a female. So also during that pre-fledge uh, period of time, uh, food is delivered to the nestlings at the door uh, by both parents. And uh, the two top uh, pictures are the parents. So we have on the left-hand side, we have a female. And on the right-hand side, we have the male. So the nestlings are now at this stage competing for that door opening uh, to receive the food. They wanna be first in line and uh, also to look out. So in, uh, in 2020, uh, we were very fortunate to have Patsy and Jim Duncan uh, from Discover Owls. Uh, they are scientists, biologists. Uh, they came to our nesting site and banded our nestlings. So under the authority of Discover Owls permits, uh, they were able to band our five uh, kestrels. Uh, we had uh, that year, we had three males and two females. And they record as part of the banding, uh, the band numbers, 
the gender, the GPS coordinates. That information is submitted to a Canadian and American shared uh, North American bird banding office. So anyone can actually request data from the office. Um, so for example, if uh, a dead bird is found uh, or a banded uh, bird is uh, recaptured, they can report it to the banding office. So now it's time for fledging. Uh, the feathers are, uh, are, are uh, grown enough that, uh, that they can take their first flight. Um, this is around the 28 to 31 days of age. That first flight is typically not very graceful <laughs> or competent. Uh, so it's not uh, um, uncommon to, uh, to find the nestlings on the ground after that first flight, uh, but they are capable of flying a little bit and climbing up trees and bushes uh, to protect themselves. So during that uh, pre-fledge and fledge period of time, um, New Sun Cinema, we will uh, keep our distance and we will continue to do observing outside, uh, but we do that uh, from a blind. And you can see that blind on the uh, picture on the right hand side. Uh, we um, are able to then watch all of their natural behaviors so they're not uh, disturbed uh, by seeing people. They will stay in contact uh, with the parents uh, for the next few weeks until they reach independence and uh, they will um, learn from their parents. They'll practice their hunting skills and then they have to survive on their own. So what we have here are some uh, photographs of the nestlings uh, shortly after fledge. Uh, the top two pictures are uh, the adult. So this is a female and she's feeding uh, the young. And in the bottom pictures, you can see that uh, these are actually the, uh, the fledglings. So the young grow very, very fast. Uh, and you can see here, they are anxiously awaiting the delivery of food by the parent. Uh, the bottom right hand corner is uh, both a female on the left and the male, you can see his uh, slate blue kind of grayish wings and he's standing on the very tip of that uh, branch. So as they continue to, uh, to grow and develop, uh, they have taken on all of the uh, plumage characteristics of, of an adult. Uh, the two top photos are a young male, and you can see his beautiful wing there on the left-hand side, all stretched out, uh, that slate blue uh, with the white spots on it. Uh, the bottom pictures are uh, young females, and uh, learning how to preen themselves and waiting for probably the arrival of some food from their parent. Here we, again, uh, a few more pictures of uh, young fledglings. As I mentioned uh, earlier, you will see them on hydro lines, uh, power poles. Uh, because they do have the coloration of the adults, uh, one key indicator to help you uh, to distinguish between a, a young one and, uh, and the more mature uh, adult. So like, as you can see, the uh, top left-hand picture is an adult male. Uh, and look at how long that tail is compared to those two young ones in the two bottom pictures with the very stubby tails at this stage. So the young, of course, are uh, learning to hunt. Uh, they will often hunt as a family group. And we have here top left-hand picture. Uh, we have a little male uh, sitting on an evergreen. On the right-hand side, the group is together, um, learning to hunt from, and uh, the bottom we have a, a young female on the left and a young male on the right, probably looking for insects, bugs, potentially voles as well. So as, uh, as winter sets in, 
the American kestrels will head for warmer climates. Uh, so this uh, beautiful little uh, female uh, from a few years ago, hopefully uh, she made it down south. Uh, they will travel as far south as uh, Panama and the Caribbean. And females typically will, uh, will fly south first uh, to that uh, wintering ground. Um, we absolutely adore the American kestrels. Uh, they're lovely uh, colors, their plumage. Uh, they have a feisty, feisty personality uh, and they're just so much fun to watch. So I hope that uh, this has given you some interest uh, in what we do here at New Sense Cinema with regards to the American Kestrels. Uh, check out our website, um, in particular Kestrel Corner. And we have lots of data, lots of videos, photographs of uh, what we've done over the years. Uh, our 2021 uh, season has started already. We have a uh, uh, mating pair at our nest boxes. Uh, they are certainly going through the courtship stage. Uh, lots of uh, activity uh, in the nesting boxes. She has not yet chosen which box she wants, um, but uh, he is definitely working hard to, uh, to keep her in the territory. Um, and uh, yeah, they are certainly a lot of fun to watch. So uh, thank you so much for your time today. And um, any questions you have, I would be happy to try to answer them. And if I don't have the answers, uh, I will get back to you with information. Thank you so much. Kim, that was great. Thank you so much uh, for presenting. I think we oh, all, you're I, welcome. Mean, I didn't know much about uh, the Kestrels before that. So I'm sure, I don't know if anyone else did, but very great. <laughs> I learned lots. So they seem like some really cool birds. Um, so we will have about yeah, 10 or 15 minutes now for, for some questions. We do have a few in the chat, so we'll start with those, but then if people oh, want okay. to take turns and be unmuting and we can uh, work through some of those as well. So uh, the first one uh, from Diane, she's wondering, uh, where do you get the Aspin shavings? Um, we actually just buy them from a pet store. Uh, mm -hmm. And so these would be shavings that uh, you know people would buy for their uh, guinea pigs. Wow, multi, uh, multi-use. Multi-use, uh, multi-use shavings. Yeah, when we go shopping for those shavings, the store clerks don't usually hear that they're for nesting boxes. Um, uh, Helen is wondering, uh, do kestrels eat rabbits? No, um, because the American kestrel is such a uh, small bird, um, as I say, you know, about the size of a morning dove, a robin, um, really, uh, the voles um, and uh, smaller animals like that uh, are what they will hunt for. I definitely have read research that they will also go after squirrels, but I've not witnessed that uh, throughout our time. Okay. Um, do the, the female kestrels sometimes decide that the, the male or the, the nest box isn't for them and the leave? Yeah, uh, I guess that is possible. Uh, we have certainly seen two females fighting uh, over the same nest box. Uh, and of course the more aggressive one will, uh, will win. Um, but yeah, she, she can definitely make that decision that she either doesn't like the territory, doesn't like the nest box, doesn't like the male. Uh, maybe he's not supplying her with enough uh, gifts of food. Um, and uh, we had, unfortunately, throughout our time, uh, we have had a nest box that actually had eggs in it that uh, were abandoned. So we don't know why they left the area, uh, but uh, that certainly can happen. Okay. Um, do they have any predators? Yes, they do. Uh, they have uh, birds of prey, other birds of prey. Uh, so larger, uh, the sharp shin hawk, um, other, uh, well, even, you know, red tail hawk would, uh, would certainly go after, uh, after a kestrel. Um, humans, unfortunately, they are uh, a predator for, uh, for the kestrels as well. Of course. Ah. Um, what and, you... and, and also, too, I should mention that uh, they, the young especially are very vulnerable uh, when they're on the ground. So um, cats and dogs. Oh, of course. 
Um, yeah. What do you use to clean and disinfect the, the nesting boxes? <laughs> well, I can, I can tell you, fortunately, that's my husband's job. <laughs> so uh, in the fall, we take the nesting boxes down um, and uh, my husband will then just uh, sand uh, down the walls and, uh, and the ceiling. Um, I usually stay pretty far away when he's doing that task. <laughs> Good job to, to skip, it sounds like. Uh, are you able to uh, keep tracks of the ones you that have been banded? Um, in 2020, that was the first time that we've actually uh, had the opportunity to get our kestrels banded. Um, at this point, um, we have not seen a banded kestrel in our area. We certainly are hoping to see if uh, maybe one of our young from last year uh, return uh, to this area because of course that they will return to uh, the territory that they were born in. Uh, we know that our uh, kestrels were uh, banded and the band, a silver band um, is on their left leg, but no, we have not seen any yet. Hopefully someone soon or in the coming years. <laughs> um, are these, is it possible to purchase these nest boxes or is that something that you have to, so everyone have to build on their own sort of thing? Like, is there a supplier uh, somewhere? Yeah, uh, my, my husband is a former uh, custom cabinet maker, uh, but uh, no, he's, uh, he's far too busy with what we're doing with our research and conservation uh, to offer building uh, nest boxes for people. Uh, but what we do have on our website, uh, we do have the video of the construction of the non-invasive nest box, which is a pretty complex box. Uh, you'd have to have some good carpentry skills for that one. Um, and, uh, but he also has a simple nest box uh, design on the website. And really, you don't need necessarily a whole lot of tools or, uh, or knowledge for that. Great. And yes, and when we send out the, the, record, the link to the recording of this presentation, we'll include uh, links to, yeah. Kim, or to New Center, mm -hmm. the, the website. Yeah. So you'll be able to find yeah. the plans there. Yeah, um, for sure. We'll... Um, uh, let's see the next question from uh, Joanne. She's wondering where your boxes are located. Uh, the boxes are located uh, on our property. We have uh, an acre just inside the city limits. Um, we have, uh, because we want to give the kestrels some options, so we have a tree line and we have one nest box close to the tree line and then we're, uh, we have another nest box not that far away and it's in the open area. So they do get uh, that opportunity for choice. So they're uh, probably, I'd say about uh, 250, 300 feet away from our house. Okay. Which is, which is why we are observing them from the blind. Uh, we don't go out there uh, during the courtship. Uh, we don't want to disturb them. And we certainly don't want to uh, change any of, uh, any of their natural behaviors when we're observing the, them and their young. Okay. Um, would you ever change the, the shavings during, while they're in there or once they're, they're down, they're there for the season? They are, the, they are there for, uh, for the season. So uh, <laughs> they, the, even though it's a smelly place uh, from our perspective, um, fortunately they, uh, they don't have a, a very uh, sensitive smell. Uh, so I'm, sh I'm sure that it's fine for them. <laughs> and then uh, Catherine and Kathy are both wondering, do they uh, ever return to the same nesting box? Well, now, this is definitely just all assumption on our part, uh, but we do believe that we have had the same nesting okay. uh, air back. And w the only reason I say that is that we live and breathe for months watching these birds uh, and uh, we watch them day and night. And so you start to see a lot of interesting behaviors. And so from one year to the next, we'll see, for instance, a male behave very, very uh, similarly from one year over the next. And then all of a sudden we have a male in the territory and he doesn't have that behavior anymore. So a lot of times our assumption is, hmm, 
I think we have a new pair here this year. Uh, and Bob is wondering, do they ever mate for life? <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> and uh, we've actually uh, had the opportunity of witnessing um, a female in a nesting box uh, incubating. Uh, another female arrive to the area and her male copulate with that female. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Uh, so, and then Helen is also asking, um, she said, you said they like forest edges and open areas. Would it be wise to put up nest boxes or could you put up nest boxes if you live in an urban area? Well, I mean, we, we are certainly in an urban area. Uh, we just have a lot of, um, of open space uh, because of, uh, of having an acreage. Um, but certainly, I think if the uh, if the conditions are right, uh, the you could potentially draw the nest uh, the kestrels in, because they hunt um, from a perch. That's a key factor. Uh, so whether that's an artificial perch uh, or natural tree line, uh, but they certainly do require some open space because of the fact that they are uh, hunting for those voles, a lot of insects grubs, bugs, you know, on the ground. Um, do we have any other, uh, any other questions? It looks like those are the, we've reached the bottom of the chat. A lot of uh, thank yous, Kim, for, for your presentation, oh. people saying thank you, so. Oh, you're welcome, yeah. All right, well, if that's it, I guess we will, oh, thank you, Kim, there. Well, I guess we will start <laughs> to wrap up. So yes, uh, thank you, Kim, so much for, for presenting today. Again, that was really cool, really cool to see all that, the work you and, uh, you, you do with uh, these birds and thank you for, for teaching us about them. Um, oh, I, oh, you're very welcome. Uh, if any other questions come up or if you see me at the zoo and you wanna stop me and talk, uh, I mean, I can talk for hours about the kestrels. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Can you please tell me, would they nest in a barn swallow um, nesting box? Ooh, good question. Uh, in a barn swallow, um, I'm not that familiar with the barn swallows, but are they, are they the ones that typically have that clay type of, uh, structure attached to the roofs and that sort of thing? No, no, they're, okay. they're most of them are wooden structures, but they're up quite high off the ground. Okay. Okay. Well, because kestrels have had to learn to become very adapted, um, you know, because of last, uh, loss of, uh, of their natural habitat, they are, you know, going into, uh, in hum into human built structures. Uh, so I guess that's possible if the, if the territory is right. So if the, if the food supply is good, um, if, uh, if there's, you know, low ground cover uh, vegetation uh, for where those voles like to be and that sort of thing. So I guess it is very, very possible. Um, like I say, one of our nest boxes is at, is at 14 feet and others at 20 feet. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any other questions? All right, well, <laughs> thanks again, Kim. Um, we will, so we will share uh, once, um, uh, Kim, you have the live streams up and running. We will share those as well. We'll maybe we can have yes. some updates through the through the, the the fledging period and the nesting period, and we can provide everyone with those. Since I'm sure we'll all be invested, it's great yeah, to watch our, the the live stream. So exactly, our 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 2021 report um, is up on our website. Uh, the live stream is not yet going. Uh, we don't do that until well. First of all, she chooses uh, the nest. Uh, box that she wants and that the first egg is laid. Uh, but uh, I hope I've built up a little bit of excitement about uh, the kestrels with you. Uh, so do pop out to the uh, 2021 report on Kestrel Corner on our website. And uh, to, uh, to, to interest you, what my husband's done this year uh, for the first time is he's put some uh, raw footage, so some uh, highlights of what we've been watching 
as they go into the different boxes, as they're uh, making that uh, nesting bowl, the depression in, uh, in the shavings. Um, they, their courtship behavior is also quite interesting. They call and talk to each other a lot. Uh, it's quite uh, a powerful uh, voice that they have. Um, and, uh, and they do a lot of bowing to each other. So the male will especially, uh, when he's trying to call that female into the nest that he wants her or potential nest that he wants her in, um, he will do a lot of calling and bowing at her or at, uh, at the hole, trying to draw her in. Cool. All right, well, oh, we have one last question actually. Oh, uh, Diana's yeah. wondering, do males ever fight for the, the terror? Oh, yes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they are very swift flyers. Uh, lots of uh, outstanding uh, maneuverability and, and whatnot. Uh, we have witnessed um, males fight uh, in the air. Um, males will also uh, fight off other predators. Um, so crows, magpies, uh, other nesting cavity birds, uh, such as uh, flickers, for example. We've seen some battles where a flicker has gotten into one of the nesting boxes uh, and, uh, and the male and or the female uh, will go after them. Uh, now, in our time, we have found that the females, uh, they are extremely aggressive. They will even um, grab at each other, clasp uh, each other and fall to the ground and tumble and still continue to fight uh, on the ground. So it, uh, they're, they're a feisty bunch, that's for sure. Wow. Uh, well, again, <laughs> thank you, Kim, so much. Oh, you're very that welcome. Was, that was incredible. That was great, really interesting. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us.